Ran across something this week that was entitled, How to Know You're a Farmer. Now, I'm not a farmer in any way, but I've lived among the farmers now for a number of years. And we came across this. You know, you're a farmer if your dog rides in your truck more than your wife. You've driven off the road while examining your neighbor's crops. Your animals live in buildings more expensive than your house. You convince your wife that a trip to pick up parts is a vacation. <laughs> you can remember the fertilizer rate, seed population, herbicide rate, and yields on your farm you rented 10 years ago, but you can't recall your wife's birthday. You've used a tractor with a loader as scaffolding for painting or roof repairs. You've used the same knife to make bull calves into steers and to peel apples. <laughs> yeah, I believe that one. <laughs> you wave at every vehicle, whether you know them or not. You give directions to your farm by using area landmarks, not by road names or numbers. The next one I have to say, this really bothered me for years. I got lost so many times because the next one is so true. You refer to farms by who owned them 50 or more years ago. <laughs> Honestly, when I first came to biking, and people would say, well, that's where so-and-so lived back in the 30s. It really didn't help. <laughs> when you were little, you beat up other kids in the school while arguing over the color of tractors. <laughs> we're coming to a new section in the Gospel of Mark. At least sort of. We're going to look at a short section. We're, we're going to... It's only going to be three sermons long. We're going to call Listening by the Seaside. And this is really the start of Jesus preparing his followers for his crucifixion. Do you know, the creator of the entire universe loves me, has a plan for my life, and I will live for him in eternity in his perfect kingdom as his child. Does that statement excite you? Does that statement mean something to you? It means everything to me. So why doesn't everyone get excited with that thought? Why do some live in indifference to the God of this universe? Why do some even live in hatred of a Savior who would love us that much? So we've gone through the Gospel of Mark. We've come across incredible miracles. We've come across John's proclamation of who Jesus is and God showing up there at the baptism of Jesus. We've had incredible acts but then, as we came to the last section of Mark, we discovered that Jesus did not live according to the expectations that people had of him. And he burst a lot of bubbles, and then we come to one big day in Jesus' life. And this is actually part way through the big day. A couple of weeks ago, the legal experts come up from Jerusalem, they examine Jesus, and they declare him of the devil. Then his family comes along and says, Jesus, what are you doing? You aren't eating. You aren't doing what you're supposed to. Come back with us. And Jesus has been teaching in the town of Capernaum. He leaves and he goes down to the seaside. Now, in Mark, it's a little ambiguous timeline, but in the other Gospels, it's clear the same day. Morning gets in trouble with the legal leaders. Gets in trouble with his family. The afternoon, or at some point later in the day, he goes along to the shores of the Galilee, and we get this teaching. It's a big day. And you have to remember that one of the things that happened in the last section was Jesus burst their bubble in one way. He was doing a lot of good deeds, he was doing a lot of great miracles, a lot of good teachings. And he comes along, and one of the things he says is, it's not going to be me doing it forever. 
I'm going to get 12 disciples. I'm going to appoint you, and you are going to learn to take over my work. Really? Hey, the great work Jesus is doing. Perfect teaching, great miracles. And what's the result of it? The legal leaders come up from Jerusalem and condemn him. That's nice. His family comes along and says, oh, what are you doing, Jesus? Come back, we'll at least get a good meal, a good night's sleep. Maybe you'll rethink all this. And so these disciples, who was just appointed, can you imagine what they're thinking? I mean, can you just imagine? Okay, you, you want us to take over? You're doing a perfect job and they're rejecting you. What are they going to do to us? What are they going to do to us? I was listening to a video that actually I'm going to show in church on Labor Day, Sunday of Labor Day weekend. I can figure this all out. And it's, uh, it's from um, David Hearn, who's the new president of the Christian Missionary Alliance in Canada. He's a very prophetic voice. Quite excited about some of the things I'm hearing come from him. And I was watching this video this week, and in this video, he was talking about the fact that we have increased secularization and opposition to the church in Canada. And he said, according to a recent poll that was done and study that was done, about 15% of Canadians who do not attend church would ever remotely consider the idea of stepping foot in a church or a church service. 15%. And he, this, our, our Dave Herman looked at the camera and he said, Do you know what? That's exciting. Now, that may not be the reaction you came up with immediately, but it's not mine. He said, It's exciting because of this. He said, In the olden days, we could only send a very small percentage of our church members overseas to hostile territory to reclaim the kingdom of God amongst people. And now we can all be missionaries in a hard place. Now, do you find that exciting? Maybe, maybe not. Probably at least a little bit scary. A little bit scary. And Jesus comes along and says, you know what? The religious leaders reject me. My family is questioning my ministry. And I'm telling you to do it. And he gives some words to give them hope. The fact that he leaves the town of Capernaum and it's made a big deal that he goes to the seaside, I think is symbolic. He's leaving the mainstream society right at this moment. He's stepping away from, from preaching in the churches or the synagogues. Now he's going down to the beach. He's going to focus there. And he talks about a sower who seeds the word. The word word is loaded. It can mean in the Bible, it can be referring back to the Bible, it can be referring to Jesus, it can be referring to this just this big idea of the truth that is behind the universe. And I think that's kind of the best way to look at it. This farmer goes seeding the great word of truth, and he talks to a crowd, but he speaks to his disciples. And he talks about four ways, or four places the seed can hit. Now, of course, he didn't really say but it does say, and as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. And later, and these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown among them. Can you grow a plant here? Well, of course not. There are some for whom the good news is nothing. The sower is going out and he's throwing seeds, or perhaps he's got a, a bag on the back of a donkey with a little hole on it, and the, the seed is slowly falling out, and some of it falls on hard rock. And it does nothing but feed the birds. 
actually Satan, as you listen to it. Satan who comes along and makes sure that it means nothing. We discovered a couple weeks ago when Jesus talks about a sin for which there will not be forgiveness. That there are sometimes souls that are so damaged that forgiveness means nothing to them. There is no place for hope to enter their heart. It is irrelevant. You cannot convince them. Only the Holy Spirit can break up hard soil, and these ones will not let the Holy Spirit work. They cannot see the need of a Savior. They cannot see the possibility of love from heaven. They cannot see possibly that God exists, or even if he does, that he's perfect. Sin does great damage. Sometimes they can be very nice people. It doesn't matter how much sin they do. It's quite amazing sometimes when you walk, meet some older folks or something like that who've lived a long life, but they haven't lived a life that is healthy. I've occasionally sat down and talked with somebody extended care or something, and they're puffing their cigarette. And you know they didn't eat well or look after their bodies their whole lives, but they've lived to a ripe old age, and you kind of wonder, how on earth is that possible? Especially when you look at somebody who may have died young, but lived a very healthy life. Sometimes that's how it is with sin and how hard our hearts grow. It's not how much sin we do that necessarily affects whether our hearts have grown hard. There are some people who have lived hard lives that God can do great things in. And there's others who are very nice people, but the love of Jesus just can't penetrate their hearts. Just the way that it is sometimes. The religious leaders come along, you think they would know better, but their hearts are hard. Will some reject the word of God? And the answer is absolutely. Other seed falls on rocky gravel, And Jesus says it, it can immediately spring up. But there's no depth. There's a lot of gravel out here in the parking lot. A lot of stuff tries to grow in that gravel. Just had to spray it recently, actually. But nothing grows big back there. Nothing grows real big because it's so rocky. And that which does... Even the dandelions, they'll certainly grow in the gravel, but they don't look quite as healthy as the stuff in my lawn. But it will grow. I've seen this many times in people's lives where they are really excited. They hear the word of God and they're excited by it. Something in it says that this is something neat. And they become interested in God and they start to like church, but only for a season. They become infatuated with God. And infatuation is a lot different than love. It can be really exciting. In fact, sometimes it can be more exciting than love itself. Is their salvation real? I don't know why I'm quite the one to make a judgment call on that. Sometimes it doesn't mean because somebody walks away after a while that they're not going to come back. But I do know this, salvation is not something that is weak. Salvation is strong. Salvation is powerful. Salvation is commitment. It is internal. Infatuation with God is purely an emotional response to God. And emotions come and go. There is no depth to infatuation. We need to grow deep. I've talked occasionally over the years about a, a way to think of discipleship of eyes, ears, hands, that we see Jesus, and we add on to seeing Jesus, hearing about Jesus, we add on to that the hand which is serving Jesus. These people have eyes only. They've seen something that really catches their eyes, and they like it, but then something else catches their eyes, 
And before they really take in root, they've heard the word of God, they chase after the next thing that they see. We need to add on to the scene of Jesus' death. There's others that fall along the weedy ditch. Why am I saying the weedy ditch? I was looking out my office window as I was writing this at the little culvert that runs beside the church and looking at all that was growing in there. Things grow in there very well. There's a lot of water. It's very wet. It's closely related to the last idea. But instead of seeing tribulation that scares somebody off, weeds come up and choke it. So I was preparing for this, I was reading that someone in that part of the world, they want to cheat a little bit before they're ready to seed the ground. They'll come along and they will burn their field to get all the weed off. And what happens when you do that? The weed's gone on the surface. It's kind of like controlling weeds with a lawnmower. It makes it look better for a day or two. But the roots are there. The weeds are coming back. And, weed, and the seed that gets thrown among the places where the weed has just been burnt off, the weed will come back and will choke out the plant. These are the folks who love the story of salvation. But the kids have got to get to so many different places. There's money concerns. There's so much that's going on that eventually interest is lost. They see with their eyes. They hear a little bit with their ears. But they never move to become a full disciple of Jesus. They can hear. But you know what? Commitment only comes through battle-scarred action of serving Jesus. What is a weed? On the edge of my garden, there's a whole row of raspberry plants. And they want to take over the whole garden. I'm continually having to dig down and dig out where the, the root has gone underneath my peas or onions or whatever the case may be. And now a shoot is coming up of raspberries trying to claim that spot too. And what is interesting is right here, that raspberry is a weed, but 18 inches over that way, it's not. A weed is something that grows where it's not supposed to. Sometimes the weeds can be good things. Looking after my kids' needs is not a bad thing. But if that becomes all that I see, if that becomes the main focus of my life, then it's a bad thing. Earning money to feed my family is not a bad thing. But when kept earning money becomes the whole focus of my life, it is. And it tends to choke out that which is good. But there is good soil. The story of a gentleman who ends up in jail by the name of Baba, who was wrongly convicted down in the American South. He was a good kid. Just was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Probably should never have gone to jail. His dad was a farmer and sorely missed his work on the field. And he wrote to him in the first spring the Bubba was in jail. Dear Bubba, we all miss you here on the potato farm. It's just about springtime and soon it will be time to plant the seed potatoes. I'm getting up in years now and I have no one to help me turn the soil. I know if you were here you would help. Hope everything's okay for you. Love, Dad. Bubba received the letter and wrote back, Dear Dad, everything is going okay so far. I miss all of you too. I wish I were something I could do to help, but please, whatever you do, do not turn the soil in the potato field. That's where I buried the bodies. Love, Bubba. Within days, the police had that field turned up and the soil was ready to go. <laughs> talks about the seed falling on good soil and producing grain, growing up and increasing and yielding 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. 
Why this story now? Why is Jesus telling it? He's saying, they may reject me. Most will not grow and become my disciples, but go anyways and preach the word. We have these bags around. Okay? The person who gets this bag may very well take what's inside it and sell it to buy booze. That's possible. And it's possible that the one who gets this pretty patriotic bag over here, which is Canada on it, may one day use the bag to carry around drug paraphernalia. And it is distinctly possible that the one who gets this one is going to laugh about these silly rural folk who came out and gave them this stuff. And they may mock what's going on. It is distinctly possible. And it's possible that the person who gets this bag is feeling depressed today and even suicidal. And their heart is touched by it. And it is possible that the person who gets this bag may be the only one out of all 55 of them that looks inside and finds a Bible at the bottom and reads part of it. If that person reads their Bible and that person's heart's touched and the rest all mock us, does that make it worthwhile? It may be getting harder to preach. It is easiest to hear and focus on those who reject the gospel. It is easiest to focus and hear those who are cynics among us. And Jesus tells this story to encourage the disciples. Do you know what? You may get lots of seed that falls in the bad soil. But there will be seed. There will be seed that falls on good soil. What does a harvest like that look like? I don't know. It's distinctly possible that God has a great harvest right in our community. That there are disciples out there who do not yet know Jesus. For all I know, Viking school right now, maybe a kid who's going to school there, you can't imagine coming to church on a Sunday morning, but they're going to become a missionary who's going to change a nation. For all we know, there is going to be the next Billy Graham that comes out of our community. There may be those among who live in our community, live in the area, never step foot in our church right now, but maybe somebody with a huge heart who's just going to bring love to those who desperately need it. And Jesus says there is potential. Do not fall to discouragement. Do not fall to cynicism. There is good soil. And when we are obedient disciples to Jesus, we can change this world.